Uh, we're uh, going to continue our series in Acts. So if you have a Bible or a tablet, phone, you'd like to turn there or click yourself there. It'd be wonderful. Acts chapter 1. As I uh, was praying that prayer confession there, I just was amazed. You know, I, <clears throat> we, we put that together uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so that, that wasn't a response to, uh, to the events of, of this week. Uh, but what an appropriate prayer. Um, as I was praying it, I thought, man, I think, I think the Lord uh, ordained that for us to, uh, to pray together. And, and I believe also that it's not an accident that we're in, we're in Acts chapter 1 uh, this morning, and we'll be looking at verses uh, 6 to 11. Uh, it's, it's very appropriate, and hopefully you'll... You'll see why here uh, in a couple moments. But, but as a reminder, uh, Acts is, is book number two of, of Luke's work, uh, Luke's gospel. And then he also uh, wrote Acts. And uh, those, those two uh, books are meant to be together. And they're, they're written uh, to a specific person whose name is Theophilus. Um, and Luke, uh, in his gospel, says why he's writing uh, these his gospel in, in, in this book of Acts, which is so that Theophilus, a believer in Christ, would have certainty in the things that he has been taught. So as Luke unfolds Acts, he's telling the story of, of the church, uh, of, of, of Jesus' call for his believers uh, to, uh, to become a, a family of God uh, that has a mission and that's exactly what we, we find out here uh, in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 6. The, the mission uh, of the church. Why does the church uh, exist? Uh, we see the heartbeat uh, found here in these verses. So let's check it out. Acts chapter 1, beginning our reading in verse 6. Uh, friends, this is God's word, and it says this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, and as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We'll end our reading there as pray. Father in heaven, uh, we bless your name this morning. Lord, we turn our eyes uh, to you, to, to your throne where, where Jesus has ascended and is reigning and in charge. And we do that this morning, Lord, to worship you. We do that, Lord, uh, because we love you. And frankly, Father, we're happy to turn our, way, our eyes away from Washington, uh, away from all the cares and the concerns that our hearts are uh, just burdened by with the hope, Lord, that after we look upon you and see you, and catch a glimpse of your glory that we might look back to Washington and to the cares and the concerns of our hearts with renewed hope and power and perspective. Would you grant that to us uh, this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. I learned a new word this week. Some of you know what that word is. That word is what the, all the cool kids are saying, from what I hear, 
That word is janky. Janky is a slang term for something run down of poor quality or unreliable. And it's that last part that caught my attention in that definition. Something that is unreliable. I think our nation, our government in particular, may be janky. (laughs) And I could go on and on and tell you why I feel like that. And if you use social media or you watch the news, uh, you're, you're hearing that right now. And I think by God's grace, I <clears throat> have guarded my heart from that. And I've looked at my own heart. And, and I'll encourage us uh, to do that uh, this morning. Because what I think is happening is, is that my heart and a lot of hearts are being exposed that we might have misplaced our hope in our government. Is it possible that we've done that? I I think it is. And that's not a a, a new phenomenon uh, among uh, human beings. It's not a new phenomenon uh, among God's people uh, to do that. Because that question is actually asked of Jesus here in, in this text. In verse 6, when the disciples are there with him as he is about to leave and go up into the sky, which is absolutely amazing, by the way. It says, when they come together, they ask him this question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they, they had a hope. And it's a hope that, that's not foreign to Jesus because he dealt with this his entire earthly ministry, that people had expectations of him, claiming to, to be the Messiah, that, that he would come and he would work through Israel, the, the nation, to, to, to make things better, to, to make things right. Because Rome and their oppressive rule had been doing a horrible and janky job. So people, God's people, have always dealt with this problem, a misplaced hope in government. You see, government was was never meant to, to be our savior. Our government was never meant to solve all of our problems. The scriptures are clear that the role of government, from God's perspective, the reason why he raises up nations and gives them power is that they would restrain evil from taking over this world. The government has never been created or blessed by God to be our Savior. And it's really fascinating to me that the answer to a a misplaced hope in government is found right here in our text through the unexpected marching orders of Jesus to his church to be witnesses to the world. You see, he says in verse 8 that they will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and that we and they must be the witnesses of Jesus. Who would have thought that that would be the answer to misplaced hope? To be a witness of Jesus. Jesus. You see, the church, its heartbeat 
It is to be a witness. It's to be a witness of Jesus. Let's explore what that actually means this morning. I think in our text, we we see Jesus' call, his command that, that we would be witnesses that he is alive, that we would be witnesses that he is Lord and that we would continue to be witnesses until he comes again. It's, it's really that simple. We must witness that Jesus is alive. What does the witness say? Well, the witness says what Jesus told them to say back in Luke chapter 24. At the end of his gospel, it says this in verse 46. Thus it is written that the Christ, or the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. That that's what the witness says. That is to be the heartbeat of why God's people gather together and commit themselves together to accomplish the mission of God. To tell people that Jesus suffered, that he died, and that three days later he was raised from the dead And that he calls people like you and I, all people everywhere throughout the world, to repent and to have forgiveness of their sins. That's the simple gospel message that the witness says Jesus is alive. That's why the church exists. See, this message is meant to be the house. It's not meant to be the shed. I remember hearing that illustration at at a missions conference uh, several years ago where uh, Richard Pratt, uh, who has a wonderful ministry, by the way, called Third Millennium. Uh, You can uh, go on the computer and find out more about that. But he described how churches uh, often uh, think of themselves, you know, you have a church building, if you can imagine that, and you have all sorts of things that happen in this church building. You have, you know, you have different ministries, you have nurseries, you have children's ministry, you have family ministry, you you know, the list goes on and on. This, This is what happens in the church building, and outside... Beside the church, you, you have a shed. And, and that's the mission shed. And, I, and, and he even described it. You know, we're going to have a congregational meeting here in a couple weeks uh, in which we'll present the budget to the congregation. And you'll see it. You'll see that there's categories in, in our budget in, in which we, uh, as a group of elders, say, okay, we need this much money to do and accomplish these different ministries. And one of those is missions. Pratt says this. Pratt says, I think that the church has gotten it wrong. Because the entire building, including the shed, is supposed to be mission. It's supposed to be this message that that Jesus says. The message that Jesus suffered, he died, and then three days later he was risen from the dead so that repentance and forgiveness of sins could be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. See, the church is the mission. It's the mission. It's why we exist. It's not a shed. It's the actual house. And Jesus has empowered us to be his witness. 
that he is alive. It's meant to be the heartbeat of the church. It's, it's meant to be the heartbeat of our lives. Do we wake up in the morning and think to ourselves, who can I witness to today? Who can I share the gospel with? Who can I tell that Jesus suffered, that he died, that three days later he was risen from the dead? He calls people to repent, to receive forgiveness. That's what it means to be the heartbeat. Is anybody convicted yet? Yes. Will we be the witness of Jesus? You see, the reason why we serve and disciple one another is so that we can be more faithful witnesses. We, we need children ministries. We need adult ministries. We need nurseries. We need them because all of those things should help us be facilitating serving one another and discipling one another so that we can be more faithful and have a better witness. If we get that out of order, we've messed it up. And by the way, it's this witness of Jesus. It's this message that he suffered, he died, he was raised from the dead, that repentance and forgiveness is available for people. It's this message that Jesus says that he has empowered by giving us the Spirit. It's this message that will change people. And people change cultures, and culture change nations. You see, that's how it's tied back to our misplaced hope in things like government. This is the answer. This is how it's supposed to work. It's not fancy. It's so simple. It's one-on-one -on -one conversation of us being witnesses, of seeing people respond because God is in their life and he has given us the Spirit and his Spirit's at work and people repent and they place their faith in Christ and God changes them. And they change culture and culture change, changes nations. That's what it means to be a witness. We witness that Jesus is alive, and we also witness that Jesus is Lord. Because that's what's happening in this very incredible event that Luke describes. You know, you read things like this, and it just doesn't do it justice, does it? Unless you just sit down and say, okay, hold on. Let me use my imagination. Are you telling me that there were 11 Galilean men, it sounds like a bar joke, right? There are 11 Galilean men, and they were there with, with Jesus, and that Jesus says that they're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they're to be his witnesses. And then after he says that, he elevates into the clouds, and a cloud takes him away. Is that not absolutely amazing? Is that, yes, that is amazing. We know that what's happening here is not only amazing, like intellectually to us, but what's amazing is, is where Jesus ascends to. He, sends, he ascends to the very throne of God where he is king and Lord. He ascends as the king. It's like a coronation ceremony that's happening here. The most wonderful coronation story ever. Jesus goes 
to the throne. And he has given his apostles his authority to go and to speak on his behalf. They speak as they witness on behalf of the ascended King of kings and Lord of lords. And our call is to go and to speak just like they did. It's fun to be a a messenger of good news. Do you know that? It's really fun. I think the greatest job in the world would perhaps be a sonographer, you know, a person who, who does an ultrasound for, for a pregnant uh, lady and then gets to reveal to them, you know, not only are you having a baby, everything looks healthy, but it's going to be a, a boy or, or a girl. Isn't it, wouldn't that be fun? Like, if you get to do that, I mean, that, what a special what a special moment that is. For, for those of you that are parents, you remember hearing that, perhaps, for the first time, or the second time, third, fourth, fifth? That doesn't get old. A sonographer gets to tell you such wonderful news. We get to tell people, friends, we get, we get to tell people, people who are lost, people who are hurting, people who watch the news and are so incredibly afraid, people who have been addicted to something for so long, people whose lives are a mess, who carry guilt, who don't have a relationship with God, we get to tell them that Jesus suffered, that he died for them, that he was raised from the dead for them, that they could be forgiven of their sins, spiritually reconnected to God, We get to tell people that. We get to speak with with the authority of Jesus. And he says, you'll receive power. When you step out in faith and you have that conversation, you can take to the bank that you are doing so on my authority. And that the power of God No matter how you say it, God can certainly work. Do you know you speak with Jesus' authority? This one who was ascended up into the sky, into heaven itself, into the throne room of God, who sits there as Lord of all, who you're speaking for, we get to We got to do it like Jesus would do it. We got we got to speak like He would speak. How how would Jesus speak? Well, I bet First Peter chapter three verse fifteen gives us a clue. Where Peter says, "Always give a hope for the reason within you with gentleness and respect." That's how we speak. We speak like Jesus would, but we also speak boldly. Like Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save. We get to speak for the ascended Lord. That he suffered, that he died, that he was risen again. That he calls us to repent and people to repent and to receive forgiveness of sins. 
Jesus is alive. He is Lord. And we keep saying that until He comes again. And that's where our text concludes. How long should the, the witnesses speak? Well, we, we see how long through this question that the angels that appear there, which is absolutely remarkable, by the way, these men in white robes obviously are angels. And they say, why are you guys still here? <laughs> why are you still here looking into the sky? I'm sure they would have said, well, it's pretty obvious that it's not normal that a human being just went on up into the sky. That's why we're still here. But the point is, is this. He, he told you, this one who just ascended, told you to go to Jerusalem and to wait for the Holy Spirit. There's a heavenly witness here. The heavenly witness says that this Jesus who, whose body, his physical body, went up into the sky is going to return in the same way. And until that happens, you go and you speak. You go and you witness that he is alive. You go and witness that he is Lord. You, you go and witness that people can receive forgiveness if they repent and turn their lives over to God. That message goes on and on until his return. At that same mission conference, that was the first time I think I also heard that this witnessing, this message that we're supposed to to go and to tell the world is actually linked to the return of Jesus. Did you know that? Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24, he said, then you will be handed over. He's talking to his disciples. You'll be handed over to, to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The, the witness of the church, us spreading the gospel to all the nations, is linked somehow to the return of Jesus. I think many of us probably this week said, Jesus, please come back. And I wonder if Jesus' response is, please be my witnesses, because I want to come back, but I said I'm not going to come back until the entire world is reached with this gospel good news message. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I need to share the gospel with people. I don't need to look for signs of his coming again. I need to go share the gospel with people. We need to do that. Will you begin to witness, then keep on witnessing? Jesus has empowered us to do that. What are some first steps? Well, I think the first step is to pray for an opportunity. Or, or perhaps somebody, God's already laid somebody on your heart, an unbelieving friend that you have a relationship with. Maybe it's time for you to have a, a conversation about the gospel. And I encourage you and myself to invite someone else into that prayer. Invite people to be praying for those opportunities, those people that God has brought across your path who are likely just waiting to hear the good news of the gospel. And if it's intimidating for you to uh, to share the gospel, use a resource. There are so many resources out there. I have some in my office. 
If you want to share the gospel with somebody, I have a resource called the Life Issue Books. It takes people right through the gospel. All you need to do is be there for them, answer any questions they may have, and encourage them to repent, to place their faith in Christ. And finally, we, we simply leave the results to Jesus. It, it does not depend on us, friends. You, you realize that, right? We can't mess it up. We can't say the wrong thing. I mean, Jesus has spoken through donkeys before. That encourages my heart every time I come up here. We're to be his witnesses. That's, that's to be the heartbeat of our church, of our lives.